Hi, I'm Brad Neal, and let's talk quickly about relativity with respect to chemistry 150. Didn't know where I was going to go with that. So here's this little equation, E equals mc squared, shows up in pop culture occasionally. You might have heard of it, you might not have. Um, basically, what it's going to tell us is that there is a relationship between mass and energy. There's a guy named Albert Einstein, you might have heard of him. He kind of concocted all this stuff up. So what does that actually mean, this E equals mc squared? For, for a photon, we can say that the energy of a photon is equal to h nu. Well, if we replace the nu and we rearrange the speed of light equation, we could say, with a little bit of substitution, the energy of our photon is going to be equal to, yes, h nu, or h, Planck's constant, times the speed of light divided by wavelength. So we can take the energy equation, the special theory of relativity, E equals mc squared, and we can substitute that in with our energy of a photon equation. And we end up with this equation that says, hey, a photon is going to actually end up having mass. Um, and that's kind of neat. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means like a photon has mass, at least in a relativistic sense. Um, and we're not going to get that deep into relativity here in General Chemistry 150. But if you don't believe me about the stuff uh, over there, it does work out. A photon will have mass. So the thought might come to your mind. Well, can mass exhibit light-like properties? Well, what does that mean? Well, does think, do things that we think of typically as having, being particles, can they possibly have wave-like properties? Because we said light is a wave that has particle-like properties, the wave-particle duality thing. What about the other way? Can we go the other way with it? And that's what de Broglie uh, studied and researched. Really fascinating research, uh, really fascinating stuff. Make sure you read through your book about that uh, for more of the details. But the essence of the question is, if light's going to be able to behave as a particle and a wave, can matter act as both particles and waves? Because we're comfortable, hopefully, at this point in time, thinking about matter as behaving as a particle. But can it act like a wave? Punchline, yes. Um, we're going to have an equation that we just rearrange from the previous slide. Um, and so now we can say for a, uh, some, anything that we're measuring, uh, we can, if it's a particle, it's going to have a wavelength. So the example that we've got written out here are two different things that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, an electron, which you should be familiar with in Chemistry 150, and a baseball, which you may or may not be. Um, the question is saying, okay, here's this thing that's got mass, and here's how fast it's going. Here's this other thing that has mass. Here's how fast it's going. What are the respective wavelengths of these two objects? Now, you can also ask, does it really matter? Like, what does it matter what the wavelengths of these objects are? And in the case of the baseball, I'll be real honest with you, it really doesn't matter. You've never seen a baseball being thrown from the pitcher's mound to the catcher, uh, or you've thrown a baseball from one person to another and seen it go like this. Hopefully you never did. Um, it'd be really fascinating if you did. But for the case of an electron, we have something that's really, really small. Look at how tiny that little thing is. Pinches little cheeks, it's so small. And it's traveling really, really fast. One times ten to the one times ten to the seventh meters per second. This is now something where that wave like property might actually be significant. So let's go in here and let's start solving what that looks like. We'll do the electron together, and I'm going to trust that you're going to do the work for the baseball uh, 
for yourself. Okay, so we had a little bit of a technical problem. Hopefully we're past that now. Let's solve the wavelength of an electron. We have the equation, the lambda equals hmc. So normally we think of with this that c is the speed of light. In this particular situation for the de Broglie wavelength, we are going to focus on c being our velocity of our particle. Um, so sometimes you'll see this written out for the de Broglie wavelength. De Broglie is going to be h m v, not nu, not frequency, but v velocity, speed. Okay, so since we have that, it's time to plug and chug. The wavelength, that's a terrible lambda, the wavelength of our electron is going to equal that 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th, negative 34th joules times second. Our mass is going to be the 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms times our velocity, which is going to be the uh, 1.0 times 10 to the 7th meters per second. And the units are all going to cancel out. You can do the unit analysis yourself. You can start with the joules and break that out into what its fundamental units are. Um, at the end of the day, we're going to end up with meters being our final unit. We can type that into our calculator, and I actually did that on a previous page, and what you should find is a number that's around the 7.27 uh, times 10 to the negative 11th meters. If you kick that over to nanometers or something like angstroms, you're going to see that, yeah, it's still a pretty small number, but now the wavelength of an electron, especially an electron moving around at the speed that we have listed, is going to be significant. This wavelength does now indicate that the wave-like properties for an electron are going to be significant. And we're going to see that pop up when we start talking about quantum mechanical models past the Bohr model. So we're going to go, we're going to talk about the Bohr model, and then we're going to do some uh, other models of the atom where this wavelength is going to be important.